is she talking to now? What is she up to next? Where in the world will she be? Talk to us, be. Hi, my name is Danielle Lewis, and you are watching Talk to SV. You are watching Talk to SV, and I am your host, Sandra Varner. When I sat down with three daughters of the Civil Rights Movement, a flood of memories rushed through my mind. I vividly recall the era. As a young child, that period would shape my views forever. Our guest, Lucy Baines Johnson, younger daughter of Lyndon B. Johnson, 36th President of the United States, currently serves on the board of the LBJ Foundation, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, and the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Ms. Johnson maintains that most precious to her is family. We are defined by our experiences and by influences in the course of a lifetime. I dare say that yours has been a storied existence full of notable events and imagery both good and bad. In your own words, apart from your heritage and your public legacy, how do you define Lucy Baines Johnson? Well, Lucy Baines Johnson has had a, an extraordinary opportunity to be an eyewitness to history, and uh, not by any of her own achievements necessarily, but by an accident of birth. Uh, and as a teenager, I must admit, some of that felt like an encroachment, but as a young adult, I recognized the, the great privilege that had, had been mine. Uh, Personally, I am blessed with a fabulous husband and five wonderful children and 13 grandchildren. And I've worked for many years in and around many of the areas that were so very important to my parents' legacy as well as uh, operating multiple businesses uh, with my husband. And so we've had a, a very full and vibrant life and a chance to meet uh, an extraordinary array of folks that make this country a very special place to call our own. Because you have had the opportunity to work in business and in politics, which one do you think honed your skills more and in what area? Well, public life really is is what my life has been all about. And in many ways, uh, business and uh, philanthropy and broadcasting, where I was for many years, and then and now in the in the business that I am uh, uh, with a finance business that uh, is uh, providing financial services for for folks. Uh, really, they have the commonality of, of being with people and trying to serve people and trying to make a, a, a difference in their lives. And so uh, I feel that um, there are common threads and common skill sets that have been applicable in all positions. When you talk about living your life publicly, I remember your mother fondly, though faintly, and from childhood, I couldn't really parse the impact that she had. As an adult, she now appears to have been a woman way ahead of her time. Well, I certainly thought so. Uh, at the time, they called her work beautification. And my mother always thought that that was uh, a superficial word, and it agitated her. And yet, she was had a difficult time, even though she was a great wordsmith, at trying to, to find a, a word that uh, uh, she felt was more appropriate. Today, I think we'd call that word more sustainability. Uh, very much involved, of course, in native plants. Uh, they were the love of her life and trying to speak to the soul of America, our, our, our environment, and recognizing that uh, God's not making any more of it. And we either are going to be good stewards of it or we're going to lose golden opportunities that damage our souls and limit our pleasure and our safety and our water tables and so very much that makes life worth living. The occasion that brings us together for this conversation is a lecture series that is put on by Congresswoman Barbara Lee and our former mayor, L. Hugh Harris. We adore Congresswoman Lee. How have you come to know her over the years? 
Well, Congresswoman Lee is a force of nature, and obviously she embodies so many of my father's dreams. She's bright and breezy uh, and delightful person to be around, but she's purposeful and worthy, and she attracts the best and the brightest with her, and she's her commitment to civil rights, to the issues of health care, to the issues of poverty, to the issues of our environment are so much the, the, the hub of what Lyndon Johnson and Lady Bird Johnson's public life was all about. So we feel a special kinship. But of course, what brings us here tonight is to talk about uh, the civil rights movement with a, a group of daughters of that movement whose lives were forever impacted by it. And, and for me, she's providing sort of a, a, a self-help uh, service because uh, in many ways, I think each of what, one of us, Donzana Abernathy, Carrie Kennedy, Peggy Kennedy, Wa Peggy Wallace Kennedy, we all felt in some ways so isolated and alone in, in our particular journey with our fathers. And yet so much of what each of us experienced uh, had similarities. And so this is a delightful experience for us to come together to look back at what we shared and to recognize that the work is not done and to try to inspire to whatever degree we can the next generation to pick up the torch and move on. Uh, certainly Congresswoman Barbara Lee is in, in a very forceful and meaningful way and uh, I am very proud of her and very grateful to her and Elihu Harris for inviting me to be a part of this program because the young people that I have been introduced to give me so much hope for tomorrow. Their sense of history and understanding where they've come from uh, at the Martin Luther King Center and the recognition of where they need to go is really quite extraordinary. And I have 13 grandchildren, so I'm counting on them. In closing, what do your grandchildren call you? My grandchildren call me Mare. And they call me Mare because I asked them if they would. I'm very fortunate in that respect. Uh, I only had one grandmother that I knew, my father's mother. And the eldest of the cousins was trying to say Madre, which is, of course, mother in Spanish. I don't know why she wasn't trying to say Abuela, which is grandmother, Abuelita, or Ita, which frequently grandmothers are called in Spanish. But she was trying to say Madre. It didn't come out Madre. It came out Mare. And so I asked to be Mare simply because I adored my grandmother. Once a daughter, always a daughter. This seminar series is called Daughters of the Civil Rights Era. In your interpretation of being a daughter of the Civil Rights Era, how would you define it? Well, it was a very pivotal experience in my life. The 1964 Civil Rights Bill that was a public accommodations bill uh, that made it possible for us, to, regardless of the color of our skins in this country, to be able to eat in restaurants, sleep in motels, um, uh, use our public transportation was a life-changing experience. Uh, the 1965 Voting Rights Act as well gave everyone the chance to vote regardless of the color of their skin. The 1968 Fair Housing Act made it possible for you to buy a home uh, regardless of the color of your skin, your ethnicity, your religion. And of course the 1968 uh, Immigration Act which made it possible to uh, have the quota system ended. Uh, all of those changed the face of the country as I knew it. I was a daughter of the South. I remember separate water fountains. I remember separate toilet facilities. I remember the impediments to voting in the Jim Crow laws. I had black friends. My father felt very passionate because it was all so very personal. He had started teaching in a Mexican school as a young man and seen the, the indifference and, the, and the, the, the lack of resources that the young kids had just because they were Mexican. And he saw this as an opportunity to uh, seek justice for their children and their children's children. And, and so um, not only, of course, was uh, as we approached the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President Kennedy in the 64 uh, Public Accommodations Act was in many ways a, 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 a tribute to what he had worked for from my father and from so many civil rights leaders. It's a time for us all to look back at these four great pieces of civil rights legislation to, to recognize, yes, indeed, they did change our world for 
forever and for the better because we no longer have legalized apartheid, legal separate facilities. But we have a long, long way to go before there's really equality in social justice in this country. And so it's a chance for uh, reflection and for renewal. And for me personally, to gather together with all these daughters of the civil rights movement, uh, a chance to have some sort of uh, self-help, so to speak, because we all empathize so much with each other. The road that we went was so similar, and, and our commitment to the cause is so fervent. And being here in the Bay Area and seeing Congresswoman Barbara Lee and her inspiration and that of the Martin Luther King Center and, and Mayor Harris, uh, it uh, leaves your eyes out on stems with hope for tomorrow. And as I have 13 grandchildren, I, I'm really grateful for that. It's a beautiful place with a great spirit, and I'm honored to be here. I am honored to sit across the table from you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, this is Jeff Clanning, and you're watching Talk to SV. Peggy Wallace Kennedy is daughter of George C. Wallace and Lurleen Wallace, who both were governors of Alabama. For 50 years, Peggy Wallace Kennedy has lived in the shadow cast by her father when he stood in a doorway and tried to stop two black students from integrating the University of Alabama. She says that single episode in the American Civil Rights Movement attached an asterisk to her name, a permanent mark she can never erase, despite her own history as a moderate Democrat who gave early support to Barack Obama Thank you for, for president the conversation. in 2008. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. This seminar series is titled Daughters of the Civil Rights. Are you as much daughter as you are leader? I think I am as much daughter as I am leader. Would you care to share with us some of the highlights of the past years of your fight for civil rights? Well, for the past couple of years, I have uh, uh, come out and expressed my own voice and uh, have spoken out for racial equality and have sort of stepped out be beneath the shadow of the schoolhouse door that I have been under for so long. I felt like I needed to do that to find my own voice, and I have, and I've been speaking around the country on racial equality and uh, racial issues, and uh, so I've I feel like I'm a leader in that way, but I, I did grow up a daughter of the movement also. Born for such a time as this is a phrase we often hear about the story of Esther, her strength and her tenacity. Does it feel that way to you as well, given some of the daring moves you've made? Yes, it does. It, it really does. Uh, some of them have been... Um, very daring. Some of them have been uh, scary at times, um, but things, things that I needed to do, steps that I needed to take for myself um, to make myself better, um, and a, a little voice inside of me told me to do these things and like step out and use my voice and hopefully uh, help others to find their voice. And like these young people that Barbara Lee uh, is gathering here tonight, uh, is what a wonderful lecture series. And uh, I'm hoping that I can inspire them to find their own voice so they can believe in themselves like I now do believe in myself. When we talk about looking at life through a child's eyes, certainly 30, 40 years ago for us, looking at the world through our own eyes appeared differently than it does now. What remains constant for you about the Civil Rights Movement? Well, um, I was very young. Uh, I was 13 years old when my father um, stood in the schoolhouse door. So um, that was um, very uh, 
traumatic for me because I was uh, a little, little smarter at 13 than people gave me credit for. And I knew that it was wrong. And so um, uh, I, it started there where that was where our family had to start living beneath the shadow of the schoolhouse door. And so all of that time that that's where I've, I've sort of been. So uh, with uh, my children, I wanted to start a, a legacy of my own for them. And so I stepped, I stepped out from there. We talk about legacy. We know how precious it is to have a legacy that certainly opens doors and leads the way for others. However, I'd like to ask you a separate question. In times past, and presently it seems, women have always been in the role of supportive to the luminary, to the man who is the larger figure. For you, coming up in the shadow of a very large figure, how did he help you to find your own voice as his daughter? I'm not sure he uh, helped me find my own voice, but uh, now I do believe that I am I am helping uh, my mother find her voice because she died at such an early age, 41, that she never really had the chance to find her voice. So I really feel like I'm speaking for her too. But um, uh, with my father and in our family, our family business was politics, and so you really weren't a, really allowed to, if, to have an opinion. You could have an opinion, but you couldn't really express that opinion. From a nation of segregated schools to a multicultural White House poised to elect the first female president, possibly in our lifetime, the America that we love the America that has been challenged over the years, how do you see it still improving and building upon the legacy of the Civil Rights Movement? Well, I think we have come a long way, but I think we have a long way to go. I still think we have um, a lot of discrimination. I think it is still a pall over America. Um, we still um, there are no more schoolhouse door stands, uh, but uh, the schoolhouse door stands that we have are economic and um, job opportunity and that kind of thing. So uh, we're hoping to, I hope to inspire these young people to go out and uh, find their way and, and, and help with that problem. Hi, my name is Emiati, and you are watching Talk to SV. Hi, this is Robert Townsend, and you're watching Talk to SV. Anzale Abernathy was born in the midst of the American Civil Rights Movement to Mrs. Juanita and Reverend Dr. Ralph David Abernathy, Sr. Together with their best friend, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., created the nonviolent social movement which changed American history. Her life began with the bombing of her parents' home. From that point, she became active in the integration of the elementary school system in Georgia, later growing up to witness integral decisions that helped shape American laws. Today, Ms. Abernathy is an acclaimed writer and actress. Okay. We knew the South from a perspective that many have no clue about. Right. How does it feel to be a daughter of the Civil Rights Movement and to live in progressive America as we see it today? Um, to be a daughter of the Civil Rights Movement means that there's a whole lot of responsibility that is upon you. You don't have the luxury to live your life as an everyday normal citizen because you are carrying the mantle of a heavy legacy people will turn and look and monitor your actions, your behavior. Um, and it, it, there's this great responsibility about shifting the future generation forward to keep those stories alive, to tell the history. 
Um, it is um, a heavy burden, but one that I feel that my shoulders are broad enough to bear and that God doesn't give you anything that you can't carry and something that you cannot handle. And I try to muster the strength to rise to the occasion to carry it. When we talk about carrying heavy burdens, you also carry the name Abernathy Donzale, Abernathy. Yeah. What does it feel like to have that label precede you, that surname precede you? Um, you know, actually, I'm, I'm proud of it. I know that uh, when I married, I didn't take my husband's name. And I remember my father on his deathbed saying to me, change your name, uh, you know, have a stage name as an actress, that you will have a, a different life. And I thought, oh, no, 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 my name is Abernathy. It's a long legacy of a name. We were slaves. I'm very proud of that history. I want to carry that forward. And I feel that when I say that name or when that name precedes me, I'm carrying my father, my mother, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, and a whole legacy of slaves. And so, yeah, um, I, I can handle it. I, I try. Hmm. You are an actor. And as far back as we can remember, actors have been supportive of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. Was that the influence for you to become an actor? Well, you know, it's so sort of funny. Um, I'll never forget attending the March on Washington in 1963 as a little girl and sitting on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and seeing the movie stars. And they were the people that I remembered. They were the people that I recognized because my grandmother watched all of those old movies and I saw Sidney Poitier and uh, oh, Paul Newman and Marlon Brando and um, Harry Belafonte and uh, Lena Horne and I kept thinking, I know them they can do, they are a part of the civil rights movement. But the difference is they get to go home to their homes and there are no bomb, daily bomb threats like we have at our household. And I thought, well, I'll do what they do. It's a whole lot easier. Um, but I learned through the course of my life that my life was totally incomplete. And it wasn't until the Los Angeles riots occurred and Los Angeles was burning that I found my voice and that I felt comfortable in Los Angeles for the first time. And then I knew that there is more for me to do than just to be a self-serving actor, that I have to get involved in the community and I have to give back to the community. And once that transition and that shift happened in my life, uh, I think I grew spiritually and I grew as a human being and I found a uh, calling to my life. This lecture series gives us an opportunity to hear and see up close living icons such as yourself. The mantle that you carry as being a daughter of a civil rights movement, does it shift over the course of time? Um, I think the responsibility becomes greater over the course of time because the years pass and they're gone and they cannot come back. The only thing that keeps them alive is us, those that remember, and it's important that we tell those stories. And when we tell those stories, we are fortunate enough to touch the lives of young people and to people who were not there, people who did not know them. And so our responsibility grows with time, and um, it, has become, it has thus become the driving force sort of in my life beyond being a mother, I mean a wife and uh, an aunt. and you know, a daughter, uh, but yeah. How have you grown as a result of being a daughter of a major civil rights icon? Oh my goodness. Um, you know, the death of my father um, in 1990 was uh, beyond devastating, and um, I, I, I didn't know what to do. I loved him so much and I lost him and I thought I need to tell, write about him and in writing about daddy I ended up writing about Uncle Martin and then I realized I couldn't write about daddy and Uncle Martin without writing about the history of the civil rights movement and then I realized even greater than that it was the history of black people in America and so my life took on a whole new purpose and I grew. I was no longer just an actress, I became an author. And now I, you know, work on films as a director. 
uh, documentary films. And so uh, I'm, I'm constantly evolving and growing. And I think that um, it's all because of the civil rights movement. And it's all because of them, those that I loved, that I lost, who still come to me in dreams, you know, and guide my feet. And uh, having grown up in the church, my dad and Akamad, they weren't politicians, they were ministers. You know, I know how to get down old fashioned on my knees and pray and thank God for my existence and ask the Lord to guide me. And um, that's what I think is happening now. I, 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 Congresswoman Barbara Lee is a saint. She's bringing us together in something that hopefully she will be able to take around the rest of the country. And we will be the tools and the conduit for which to bring America together so that the Tea Party does not have that one extreme and paint a false picture but help to unite America so that we don't go back. Because we did once before, you know, there was slavery and then there was reconstruction. Slavery came to an end and we got our rights and then all of a sudden those Jim Crow laws came to be and we lost our rights. And for nearly 100 years we suffered under segregation. And so now we have hope again with Barack Obama. But systematically they're trying to take away those rights and now we have to fight that they will not. And that means we need to rise up. We cannot argue like W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington did. We've got to find a unifying voice like we did during the days of the Civil Rights Movement. And our young people will be the ones who have to te take to the streets and they're the ones that we have to teach. And they will be the future, the world that we will inherit. And we want to create a world of equality, justice, liberty, and integration for everybody, not just for some, but for all. You brought with you a book. Yes, the book. This is my book, the one that I wrote. Um, yeah. Partners to History. Yeah. Martin Luther King Jr., Ralph David Abernath, Abernathy, and the Civil Rights Movement. Yeah. When did you write the book? I wrote the book uh, after my dad died uh, in 95. I started writing. What happened was, I, uh, after my dad died, I went to New York City. Uh, and spent a few days with Robert Kennedy Jr., Carrie's brother, at his home in Bedford. And he showed me a book that he had written about Lemoyne Billings, uh, who was President John Kennedy's dear friend. And I knew Lem. And Bobby showed me this little private little book that he had written. And as we walked through the woods while he was doing taking care of his hawks, he started to tell me about the responsibility that I had. Well, I said, well, Bobby, I'm nobody. You know, I'm, I'm just an actress. I don't matter in the world. And he's like, oh, but you do matter. And he started inspiring me, and I'll never forget when I left him that day, I kept thinking, if Bobby can write a book, I can write a book too. And because he inspired me so much, I asked him to write the foreword, and he wrote the foreword for my book. And uh, yeah, and uh, you, you never know what kind of impression or lasting impression you leave on someone's life. And, and you never know who those angels are that are going to come along and guide you on your path. And, he was one of those people to help guide me on that path. Special thanks to the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center and their Barbara Lee and Ella Hugh Harris lecture series who arranged our interviews with Daughters of the Civil Rights Movement. I'm Sandra Varner. Join us next time right here on Talk to SV.